revision of the Jerusalem Bible. This is the revised New Jerusalem, okay? Um, I don't like it as well as the original, but I think I'm just not used to it yet. You know, you get used to a certain translation. So anyway, this is Paul, Colossians 1.24. He says, I now rejoice in my sufferings for your sake, and in my own body I complete what is lacking in the sufferings of Jesus for the sake of his body, the church. Okay? So I'd like you to notice that he says, I rejoice in my sufferings. Actually, a better translation of that is I am gifted in my sufferings. He sees the sufferings that he undergoes as a gift because he understands this mystery of the cross business at this point in his life. And uh, he says, for the sufferings yet to be undergone by Christ Jesus. Of course, we know Jesus' salvation is complete. What's he talking about? I'll use the example of a vaccine. There's, there's two stages to a vaccine. There's the development of the vaccine, which all is all well and good, but it means absolutely nothing until someone puts it in my arm. And this is what Paul is saying. We have the salvation of Jesus Christ and the power and the majesty of that salvation that can save the entire world. But someone has to tell you about it. Someone has to evangelize you or it does, you don't participate in it. So this whole thing, he says the sufferings of Jesus are completed by people who spread the faith. Now, what are the sufferings he's talking about? The specific sufferings that he's talking about is travel. Now, I think you know that Paul traveled all over the world. Um, he was in so many shipwrecks, I'm surprised anyone let him on their ship, you know? Uh, he would be, uh, in some towns he was beat, he was jailed. I mean, you go through this whole list of things. It's, I mean, his life is a disaster if you look at those things. And yet, we owe the Gentile church to Paul through all this thing. And you look at the whole thing and you see, you know, all this going on. I was telling some people in the sacristy today about a quote, Bernstein, for, the, for Jack Kennedy's uh, memorial. He wrote a mass and uh, probably the most powerful thing in the entire mass for me is the responsorial psalm. But I could give you dozens of verses from it, but one of them is, he talks about what's going on uh, with regards to the spread of the faith and the killing of people who are trying to spread the faith and stuff. And the verse is, you people of power, your hour is now. You plan to rule forever. You never do somehow. So I stand in silent treason until reason is restored. I await the season of the word of the Lord. And that's what Paul did. He died before he saw the season of the word of the Lord, but he was responsible for the Gentile church of which we are part of, of actually bringing them to see this. So he sees this suffering. Now this tells you something about suffering. You know, in the Middle Ages, it used to be a big deal to suffer. So like they would beat themselves and do all kinds of things and this sort of thing. We have come to understand that the mystery of the cross has to do with the suffering that you encounter in pursuing the good, okay? Since you're all married men and none of your wives are here, I will tell you that marriage is a suffering and a trial, okay? Um, even as a celibate, I know that, okay? Marriage is a suffering and a trial. It's a wonderful suffering and wonderful trial. It will produce amazing results, both in the holiness of yourself and your wife, although probably neither of you believe that, you know? Like I was, I love the reading today. It's, it's one of my favorites where the kid, the father thought his son was a lunatic. I don't know a father who hasn't seen their son as a lunatic at one time or another. This, uh, this idea of, uh, of, of somehow in the, the you don't need to look outside your life for sufferings. You just need to pursue good. 
And when you pursue good, there are difficulties, and difficulties are sufferings. You know, the only suffering isn't martyrdom. In fact, I oftentimes think of, I got in trouble for saying this once in the seminary, but one of the professors was going on and on and on about uh, St. Tarsisius. Does anyone know who St. Tarsisius is? St. Tarsisius is a little tiny boy who at the age of 11 was martyred by the Romans. And he was martyred because he was carrying communion to uh, Catholics imprisoned uh, during the great persecution. And he's going on and on. I said, 11 years and he got canonized? I said, what terrifies me is 70 years, <laughs> you know? It's not dying at the age of 11. And the thing is, we are in this for the long haul. And you have no idea what the long haul is, like with your marriage, your children, uh, the life you're in. All, none of us know, but that's what we're in it for. And to know that every time you encounter sufferings and difficulties, they are the opportunities for power. And how you deal with that, that's the idea of the way grace works in you. And they will go on endlessly in all different kinds of ways, in all different kinds of uh, degrees. But you do not need to look for suffering in life, okay? If, if people think that you somehow need to find a way to suffer, they are not living a life. You need to honestly pursue it. Is Paul glad he, he suffers? Not necessarily, but he's glad that what the suffering is going to accomplish. What he's doing is preaching the gospel. And when he's preaching the gospel, if it means he's in a sinking ship, he's in a sinking ship. If it means he's being sent to jail, he goes to jail. If it means he's being beat, he's being beat. And ultimately, if it means he's being beheaded, he'll be beheaded. But for Paul, he's pursuing the gospel. And he sees this as a great and powerful privilege to take everything that comes in the pursuit of the gospel. And I think we oftentimes look romantically in everything at the cross of Jesus Christ. You know that the reason that you and I are saved is not because Jesus died on the cross. The reason you and I are saved is because Jesus was obedient to the Father. Remember the first sin. The first sin of Adam and Eve was disobedience. So salvation had to come through obedience. And in his obedience to the Father, he took whatever came with it. And what did the Father call him to do? Called him to preach the gospel, announce salvation, and let people know about how God felt about people, that God was truly and honestly a father to these people. And that's what he was supposed to do. Now, lots of people didn't like that. The Pharisees didn't like he was getting popular. They didn't like, you know, the fact of his teaching, making it too easy and this sort of thing. And also, he oftentimes honored the people who the Pharisees were, felt were least useful to the community, which is the poor, okay? The poor used money and the rich gave money. It was easy to pick out the best. And so the Pharisees were really against the teachings of Jesus and he ended up in trouble. We know he was crucified. But our salvation is because he was obedient. That's what, and the, he was obedient to whatever the Father said and whatever it cost. And that's, that's what's asked of us. You know, as, as I look in my life, at the life I've had as a priest and everything, I've had a very easy life. My parents uh, understood very early. I have dyslexia, very seriously. But when I was going through school, I couldn't read or anything. So what my parents did, and I only found this out later, my parents, every summer, we would go on vacation according to the classes I was having the next year. And uh, like, for instance, when we studied the uh, Civil War in, in uh, grade school, the summer before, we spent in Gettysburg. In the year we began a science, which was fifth grade, I think. We spent the summer before in Chicago in the Museum of Science and Industry. But my parents consistently did that because they knew I learned by things like this. And I've had very, very easy assignments 
one of the, the jokes I often tell priests in the diocese, I've always been assigned, my first assignment was Hawaii, uh, and then I've been in Monterey Diocese, always in very wealthy parishes. Monterey has more wealthy than poor parishes. But when I was being sent to the very last parish I served at in Spreckles, I told the bishop, I said, you know, I've never ever really served in a poor parish. And perhaps as my last assignment, you would send me to a poor parish. And what the bishop said to me, they already have enough problems. You go to this <laughs> parish over here. And so, but, but this idea, you know, I, I look at my life, I say it's a very easy life. But the question is not whether my life is easy or hard. The question is, am I responding to what God called me to do? Like if God the Father had demanded of Jesus, he spent six months vacation in the Bahamas to redeem us, he would have done it and we would have been redeemed. That's all there was to it. So you can't in your life, you know, judge the ease of your life. There are many people who have very easy lives and then go through very difficult times. And I'll give you an example. An example, and it depends uh, maybe uh, on your age, uh, but a good example of this is Pope John Paul II. We have never had a guy who had such a powerful life at the beginning. And he was so bright in many ways. He was not a scholar, but the communists forbade the teaching of the faith. So do you know what he did? He used to take kids on hikes and they would go through the mountains hiking. And a result of that, he was a great skier. The first gift he received when he became Pope was a pair of skis from the Olympic skiing team from Italy. That was the very first thing. And he used to go skiing and say, you know, a powerful, powerful man. And then in the end of his life, when he was dying, it would have been very simple to allow him to die and perfectly within Catholic faith. I, I think you know this. In the Catholic faith, I may not take my own life, but I have no obligation to prolong my death. Not at all. So if I'm in the hospital with terminal cancer, I don't need to do anything. I can refuse everything and die if I want to, okay? It is that decision. And they used to ask him, why are you going through what you're going through? And he says, I have lived my life teaching people how to live the gospel. And now God has called me to show them how to die. And I will. And th this idea, did he want to go through that? No, but he wanted to do what God was calling him to. That's all. So the early part of his life, God called him to go hiking. Great. Go hiking. That's what God called. God called him to go skiing. Great. Go skiing. God called him to be Pope. I always wanted to be Pope. But anyway, God called him to be Pope. And, uh, you know, you think of all those wonderful things. He always said yes. And it was hard at the end. Yes. His only answer to God was yes. That's all he asks of us. Well, I say my yes to God and whatever it brings to me in my life, I live with it. The difficulty, the good things, the benefits, all this. You live with it. And that is suffering enough. And that is the mystery of the cross. That will work. Don't go out seeking suffering on your own. And I mentioned the idea of finding out your weaknesses. You know, you find that out as life goes on. Life will reveal your weaknesses to you just by living. Uh, I, I remember uh, the first time when I was in school, I used to get through uh, most subjects uh, pretty easily because my parents uh, would, would see I, I had things so that I can handle things, see things, touch things, do things, and learn a lot. Reading is a wash. And, and an example of suffering, reading is a wash. So what did God do for my whole life? A book. I've spent my entire life teaching Bible, okay? At least he's got a sense of humor. So the, um, this, uh, this business of this, this kind of learning that I was going through, um, I would usually make it through classes, not with good grades, but, you know, survival, and, and went through. But in high school, 
I reached a subject that was the end, and I realized it was all over at that time, was trigonometry. I don't know who's taken trigonometry. I don't know why they take it. <laughs> and I'm always suspicious of anyone who passed it. But the, uh, the, the thing about it, most people don't think of this. Do you know that uh, mathematics is the only really pure thing? Like, you aren't talking three trees, three goats, three anythings. It's just three. Three doesn't exist. Three books exist. Three chairs exist. Three one, but three does not exist. Mathematics is a whole science built on something that doesn't exist numbers. And for someone with dyslexia or that participates, it is a blank wall. Okay? If it weren't for cheating, I'd never got through. Okay? <laughs> weren't for cheating. I should tell you a story about that. The, the guy who sat beside me was, was brilliant. I'll tell you how brilliant he was. We did uh, a science fair in the uh, high school. And uh, uh, each one of us did a exhibit the one and they put the best in a show and you know people came in to see the show five men came in in suits came in walked right through went over to the exhibit and looked at it he had uh, a small tube that he had made that electrically altered sound waves to create sounds and the three gentlemen i think three four the four gentlemen were from General Electric, and they had just completed a building in Texas that did what his thing did. And the guy who was looking at it said, we could build that smaller than a penny in our laboratories, and it would do everything the building did. He was given a complete scholarship through school and eventually uh, taught physics at Stanford. But uh, anyway, I always pick the right people to cheat from. You don't just cheat from anybody. <laughs> so anyway, I'm sitting beside him, and uh, we go through the answers, and each week they published the answers. And the, uh, not the answers, but they published the ranking in the test. We got a test every Friday. And so they published the rankings, and well, it was him, me, him, me. <laughs> the reason I was always second is again the dyslexia, I'd even copy some answers wrong. So it was, but uh, one week we came in, it was me and then him. And what happened probably was he had a wrong answer. I copied it wrong, but it was right when I, you know, that, cause that's the only explanation I can think. But the most humiliating thing happened to me. The professor said, Jim, I want to apologize to you because I always believed that you were cheating but last week's test proved that you are not. I felt this tall. <laughs> but I took the grade. I'm not an idiot, you know? So anyway, this idea of, of the difficulties that, uh, that I faced in my life have prepared me for things I have to do and to help other people go through. Uh, I, I just, I, I think one of the things is, is to be aware of the ability to be helpful. And i give you one experience. When I, I was in a religious order after I was ordained, and I wanted to leave the religious order. And they did not want me to leave the order. They really wanted me to leave the priesthood. They were very angry with me. And so uh, I was making all kinds of efforts. And in a religious order, if you ever violate the vow of obedience, um, you, you can be removed from priesthood and everything because it's a vow. And, but it has to be formal. So like, for instance, the provincial has to give it to me in writing in front of a witness. But if, if I get a letter in writing in front of a witness and don't do it, then I can be dismissed like that. And they had me in San Diego and it didn't give me a car or anything and I had to find a bishop who would accept me. Now, who's going to accept a man they've never met who's leaving another order? You might presume they're throwing him out. You just don't know. So it was a difficult situation. And I got a phone call from a pastor in um, Salinas. And he phoned me. He said, are the other priests in the house now? I said, yes. 
He said, you phone me back as soon as they're gone. So the, uh, the house I was in, we did retreat work, uh, going out doing parish missions, okay? So all of us would be gone at one time or another. So I phoned him when they were all gone. He said, how long are they gonna be gone? I said, about two days. He says, you pack everything you have, I'll have a car pick you up in three hours. And so a car picked me up and drove me to his parish in Salinas. And he sat me down, he knew the situation. I don't know who told him, but he said, you are never to answer the door. And if you get a registered letter, our secretary will open it. And if it is the order from the provincial, you will not receive it, period. So he said, and while you're here, he was a chancellor of the diocese. He says, once a week, I will take you to lunch with the bishop. And so I got to know the bishop, the bishop got to know me, and he accepted me in the Diocese of Monterey. Having said that, when I was pastor in uh, San Luis Obispo, there was a priest who was a member of a religious order who himself had caught AIDS. And in his parish, um, the order was so humiliated that he had AIDS that they pulled him out, wouldn't allow him to do ministry and this sort of thing. And I got permission for him to do ministry in the parish for a while. And while he was doing ministry, he was, got a phone call from one of his comrades and they said, they're gonna order you to come back. And he was terrified, he was packing, he was telling me about it with tears coming down his eyes. And I said, honey, I know how to do this. <laughs> and I said, you don't answer the door and we open registered mail, pure and simple. And his provincial himself came to visit four times. I never knew where the guy was, you know? And uh, finally, the order said that he can return when he wants. And so he went back to doing ministry in the parish. But I now know that what happened to me was to prepare me for this. Like it seemed like a difficulty to me, but I was able to help him sail through it as though nothing had ever happened. And so also when you find trials and difficulties in your life, be aware of the fact that you may encounter that in someone else's life and God's now preparing you how to go through it. And that's why how we deal with these things is so important because oftentimes by the way we deal with them and people watching us, we can educate other people how to deal with them. And then sometimes as in that case with me, you'll actually be assigned to help another person deal with the difficulties. But to be aware that as, as we're going on in our lives, these difficulties are always blessings and power. You know, when uh, in Native American culture, my family is Native American, but in Native American culture, uh, we are never supposed to petition. It's interesting to me when they restored the liturgy in the Catholic Church, they restored the litany of petitions, which is the prayer of the faithful. But you know, after communion, there used to be a litany of thanksgiving. And the closing prayer of the mass is in fact the closing prayer of that litany of thanksgiving for each day. But I don't know why they didn't restore that. But in Native American culture, you don't ask God for things and there are very clever ways of doing it. Uh, the reason you don't ask God for things is because if you have a good friend and every time you talk to him, he asks you for something, you're gonna stop talking to him. And you don't want God to try and find other friends, okay? So <laughs> it's very, very important we retain our relationship with God. But in Native American culture, one of the ways you, you pray, like, I pray every day, I thank God for the wonder and beauty of the world around us when, he have, when we have rain. I thank God for how my uh, allergies are diminished after a rain. I just tell God how thankful I am for all the wonderful things he sends with rain. I don't say I want rain. I just tell him how good things are when that happens. And learn to pray that way about difficulties in your life. Learn to thank God for what you've survived in the past. Learn to be a person of thankfulness 
in difficulties and problems. And I think one of the great things in scripture, Jesus is very, very clear to us. He says, your father knows what you need before you say it. Okay, so you don't really need to say it at all. I think it makes me more comfortable to say it, but he doesn't need to hear it, okay? But to learn to, to sort of integrate that in your prayer, because as that becomes a part of your prayer, you will become more aware of how that moment actually is power and not weakness over a period of time. And again, it's exactly like Paul, you thank God for these things that seem to be difficulties and problems, because in fact, they're furthering God's, uh, God's, God's world. Um, another thing is don't be afraid to try new things, okay? Don't be afraid to expand, and I'm talking ministerially, don't be afraid to expand yourself ministerially. When I first went to, um, uh, what do you call it, uh, San Luis Obispo, I, uh, I have a, a practice in my life that I try and listen to what I'm saying. And one of the reasons is with the dyslexia, I can't really use notes, which is one of the reasons why I tend to speak shorter. But um, as a result of that, uh, I oftentimes say things that I haven't really prepared. So I learn to listen, because that's one of the major ways God speaks to me. But I try and uh, listen and figure out kind of what's going on. But anyway, I was giving a homily one time, a homily I would generally describe as brilliant, but I was given, <laughs> giving this, this homily, and it was on the corporal works of mercy. I don't know if you remember what they are, I can't go through them all. But one of them is visit the imprisoned. And as I finished the uh, talk, I said to the people that you need to try each of the corporal works of mercy, and the ones you enjoy doing, keep doing. The ones you don't enjoy, skip. But try each one so your bases are covered. Okay? Then I got home and I was thinking about it, and that's God talking to me, because there was one I hadn't done. So I phoned the chaplain at the prison, and I said, uh, could I come in? Uh, they have a program where people come in and visit people in the prison. I said, could I come in and visit one of the prison prisoners? And he said, uh, certainly. And, uh, and then I got a phone call four days later. And he said, you know, because I'm out here at the prison and not in town, he said, I didn't know anything about you at all. But he says, as I talk to people, I think it would be a waste of time for you to visit a prisoner. I'm going to ask you to come in and give a lecture on scripture. It says the prisoners are very interested in scripture. If you want, I'll give you a text they'd like to know, or I'll give you a book, or whatever you want, or just come in and talk on whatever you want. But he says, you come in and give the class. He says, that, that would be the thing. Well, I did, and I taught scripture in prison for 30 years after that. And I went once a week. And the last thing I would ever have done voluntarily is go in a prison. And yet it became a great part of my ministry. The wonderful thing about when you go in the prison as a Catholic priest, you're one of the people they don't have to fear. And you, you have nothing against any of them, you know? And when they come in, I, I would say a quarter of the class was Muslim because it was the only place they felt real freedom. And so they would come in. I, I don't know what the effect of the scripture was on them over a period of time, but they were there for all the classes and this sort of thing. And I did that in Salinas Valley, you know, the men's colony. And then I did it at Soledad when I moved to, uh, what do you call it, to Salinas, to uh, Spreckles rather. And so the, the whole ministry was a powerful thing in my life, and I even renewed it, you know, I went to the new parish. But something I would never have encountered except that this kind of commitment to the fact that if I'm telling other people to do it, the least I can do is try it, you know. But this idea of learning how God speaks to you, one of the primary ways that God speaks to me is through my sermons and things, because I, I you know, you, you obviously prepare a sermon, 
but I prepare the sermons. But because I don't use notes, I oftentimes say what I haven't prepared, and I always consider that God talking to me. So I go back over to them, I being told, and I've been told in my life to try many things that I was never very good at, never went back to again, but I did indeed try them. And then this idea to, to really be o open to these kinds of things. Um, one of the people I had as a speech professor is Fulton Sheen. And one of the things he told us one time in class, he said, never under any condition ever refuse an invitation to speak. He says, no matter who it is, no matter what they want, accept the invitation to speak. He says, you can proclaim the gospel in a thousand different ways, talking on a million different subjects. Uh, I remember one time, uh, and you may or may not know this, but the, what's called the Big Bang Theory, uh, do you know that was developed by the Vatican? And it was developed by the Vatican observatories. The oldest observatory in the world is owned by the Vatican. It was built in Vatican City by Galileo. And so that's the oldest observatory. But the, the Vatican owns two in the United States, one in Hawaii, and a couple in Europe. And one in China, too. The biggest one they own is actually in China. And so they do research on the stars and stuff. But many years ago, um, science was saying that the universe was eternal. And you understand that if the universe is eternal, that attacks our teaching on creation. But if it always was, okay? That's, uh, and that's why, I don't know if you've ever heard this, we do not get eternal life. It's too late to get eternal life. To have eternal life, you had to have always lived. We get everlasting life, okay? My life had a beginning, it will have no end. But eternal means, so they said the universe was eternal. So the Pope commissioned the Vatican Observatory to examine the universe to find out, is there any way to establish that the universe in fact is created? And it is, it's because of the Big Bang. The universe is expanding in a certain way, so all you have to do is turn it around and you go back to a single point. And Stephen Hawkins is the one who did the mathematics to tell you the date when the universe started. But the Vatican did that. The reason why I'm telling you this story, I was at a, um, at a conference. The conference was in Washington, D.C. and It was students from uh, about 20 of the big universities. There are a lot of universities in D.C. And they were in this massive auditorium in the Smithsonian. And the talk was on the Big Bang Theory. And so they, you know, there are four different people got up and they gave talks on the Big Bang Theory. And one of the students, in order to, I think, challenge one of the, uh, the people who was speaking, he said, this must really be horrible for uh, religions. He didn't say any particular, for religions to discover that the universe began as a single point. And the moderator said, just a second, he said, that speaker who spoke first, he's the one who discovered the Big Bang Theory. He's a Jesuit and works in the Vatican Observatory. Next question. You know? <laughs> it, and you know, I think that that Jesuit priest witnessed more to the faith just by sitting there quietly at that point than anything that could have happened there. And we, we need to understand that, you know, God puts us in all these strange situations. And, you know, they, they, they may work out or they may not in the time you're there. But again, it's not yours to judge. You know, God had you there for a reason and he works the reasons as he goes. And it's, uh, they tell you another, I, I'm amazed at things like this. There is a, a family in, in uh, uh, Wisconsin, actually. Um, a young lady was born uh, in Wisconsin. She was a little tiny girl, and her parents were non-religious. I wouldn't say they were atheists, but they weren't religious. 
And every Sunday, when the bell would ring in the Catholic Church, there was a neighboring family that would walk by on their way to Mass. So this little girl asked her parents if she could go to Mass with the uh, people outside. And their parents said, sure. So every Sunday when they came by, they picked up the little girl, took her to Mass and everything. And then the little girl and her parents moved to California. I have no idea what happened to the family in Wisconsin. But when the woman, the little girl now, when she turned 25, she took instructions in the faith. And why did she take instructions in the faith? Because of the witness of those people who took her to church on these Sundays. She was too young to know what was going on in church. They never asked her to be baptized, never brought her in the faith. But they witnessed to her, and all God asked of them is be nice to that little girl. And to be nice to that little girl, spread the gospel to that little girl, her husband, her children. Incidentally, out of her children, there were nine children, one priest and two nuns. Now, all of this, just because someone was nice, and that's, that, that's the way this thing grows. I don't know how many of you have ever worked in the catechumenate, but one of the things we do in the catechumenate is we invite people in to explain why they decided to be a Catholic. You know, why, why would you, just particularly today, you know, why would you pick this church? And the stories are mesmerizing because what brings them to the faith oftentimes is people who won't find out what they've done till they come before God. Oftentimes, accidents and strange things happen that ultimately result in their being involved in the faith. I always uh, uh, think of an uncle of mine. I have an uncle who was really deep Alabama Southern Baptist. He honestly was raised with the fact that priests have horns and tails and had this whole thing built up. Well, what he did, he was drafted into the Navy. And again, with God's intimate sense of humor, uh, on three occasions, his bunkmates were Catholic priests. And uh, so he, uh, he realized the, uh, what do I want to call the satanic myth. Um, I want you to know he never became a Catholic, but he married my aunt and he raised all his children Catholic. And it was what, what really won him was actually a war. It's when people were drafted and everything. You know, we, it, the things that go on in the world, you have no idea what God's about in the things that go on. And I think it, it, it's part of being a believer that no matter what goes on in my life, no matter what goes on in the world, I should know God is only about good. That's all he's about. Now, how he does it, how he works it out, is endlessly a mystery. In fact, it's the mystery of the cross. That mystery is endlessly played out. And I, I remember the New York Times, I, you, when Italy was united under Garibaldi, the Pope became the prisoner of the Vatican. I think it was Pope Benedict, the. Uh, uh, what he called uh, 14th, but he was uh, gave up any you know powers or anything and and stayed in the Vatican, and the uh, what he called the headline in the New York Times was Benedict the 14th, the last Pope of the Catholic Church, and then with the election of the Pope who followed him, the New York Times had a letter from one of the people who works at the Times. The, uh, one does an editorial, and the person who wrote the letter, I want you to know, was not Catholic. But the thing I love in the letter, she said, every generation writes the obituary of the Roman Catholic Church only to find their children worshiping within its walls. <laughs> and it, it's true, you know, that, that we, we as a church we live on the edge of disaster. But after 2,000 years, for God's sake, we should have got used to it. We live on the edge of disaster and always survive. Why that works, I have no idea. But thank God, it works. And that again is the mystery of the cross. We are not called to live in security. We're not called to live in ease. We're not caused, called to live where 
it looks like everything works out. It just doesn't do that. And I guess I uh, close this with one of the things Teilhard de Chardin said. He said, it's very interesting. He said, if you watch the life of Jesus, he says, it's the pattern endlessly of the church. If you look in Jesus's life, he lost every battle. He lost the battle for the people, turned away from him. Lost the battle for the apostles. One of them betrayed him, the rest deserted. One of them denied him to his face. You know, people condemned Judas. At least Judas had the good sense to do it behind his back. <laughs> Simon Peter denied him to his face. You know, and you see, Jesus lost every battle, and in the end, he walked out of his tomb and won the war. That's the way the Catholic Church is. We go through history, we lose every single battle. But when it's all over, we'll win the war. That's God's promise. Thank you very much. Oh, yes, sorry. Mind your own business. <laughs> uh, does anyone have any questions? I got one. I would have guessed. <laughs> I think one of the, the things with regards to this mystery of the cross, there must be a point in your life at which you realize you are no longer capable of dealing with what you're dealing with. Then you throw yourself on the mercy of God and it works. And that's the trick. But one of the sad things in the United States, I'll tell you, is that parents in the United States protect their children from having problems. And protecting them from having problems, you're delaying the moment of disaster. And any one of you can look at your own life, and there's one thing that's inevitable. There is a moment of disaster coming, okay? And I'll tell you, in my case, it was things that occurred to me medically as a child with regards to the polio and stuff. And there's nothing more wonderful in this life than to get your disaster over with early, okay? You're gonna have one, so get it over with early. But I, I think you just, and it, it could be in anything. I, I've seen people who are pursuing a young lady for marriage, you know, with the kind of resistance, just suddenly give up. And then somehow it works out. Or with a child who's an endless problem. And somehow, you know, one of the, uh, one of the friends of mine uh, was uh, such a problem that his parents sent him to boarding school uh, for several periods of his life because he was such a real problem. And uh, when he, he came to the seminary, he became a friend of mine, but when he arrived at the seminary, he told me that his parents had no idea that he would ever ask to go to the seminary and they were surprised he did the whole system of applying without them even knowing and so and he had this history of you know uh collecting hubcaps and things he uh so he had this history but as, as he was going in um the rector of the seminary amon senior i really admire him for saying this there's a real truth to it but it's something most priests wouldn't really tell you. And the Monsignor said to the woman, uh, Jesus doesn't want anyone but problem children. And the fact of the matter is the guy has been a priest now for 50 years, you know. And I just, I just think that whatever it is brings you to the moment of desperation. One day you will thank God for that moment. And then you begin the process. It gets a slow process. You know, that it's, uh, it, it, if I were, I let, let's say, to Mother Teresa. You know, when Mother Teresa was in a grade school, Albania, was it, she was raised? Okay, so she's in a grade school in fourth grade. Do you think God ever came to Mother Teresa in fourth grade and said, 
why don't you spend the rest of your life picking dying people out of the gutters of Calcutta? He didn't. But I would be willing to tell you, in fourth grade, there were things going on in her life that would indicate one day she would be lifting dying people out of the gutter somewhere. That you would watch that grow. And that's the same thing in our lives. And that's why, like in, in today's reading about faith the size of a mustard seed, if you have faith the size of a mustard seed, it's going to grow. Now, faith is salvific, so all you need is faith the size of a mustard seed. But if you have it, it will inevitably grow. And that's because the power's in the seed, not in you. So it will inevitably grow. But it grows slowly. You know, you, you have to learn to trust God. When I, when I was in the, uh, my novitiate was in Rhinebeck, New York, and in California, you know, it's, it's possible to drive to the mountains and see the snow and drive to the beach and surf the same day. And so you can do all that in California, but there you can't. And uh, in Rhinebeck, New York, we had a pond and we went out there, the American, uh, the people from California, six of us went out there and realized one day it was frozen over. So we went upstairs and got our skates and we were down at the pond and we were rescued by the Canadians. There were a group of Canadians studying with us and they said, it is not frozen. They said, what you do is you start walking on it. And as soon as it starts cracking, you walk back. And you do that every day until you can walk across the pond, then you skate. And that's what you do. I think that's exactly what I did with God. We have no idea how solid that is, so we test it. And actually, it's more solid than the ground we left. But we won't find that out, except by walking on the whole thing, okay? That's why we have the saying in scripture, taste and see the goodness of the Lord. You can't reason to it, you can't understand it. But if you try it, it works. Anyone else? Go ahead. You mentioned that we should not seek out. Suffering. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Wasn't he seeking out suffering? But no. And he, he didn't refuse medicines. He refused to allow himself to die. He could have ended it all by allowing himself to die. But he didn't refuse medicine, nor did he refuse painkillers and stuff like that. He, he was as comfortable as he could be, but he wanted to go through the process of dying if that's what God wanted. And he... He said, he was saying to someone at one point that he said, it might be very different if I was a parish priest in Poland, but he said, I'm not, I'm the pastor of the world. So he says, here, I need to witness to it. Okay, anyone else? Okay, thank you. See you later. <laughs>